Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for, first of all, inviting me here to give this talk today and uh, for so many of you uh, turning up. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about war and space. Uh, hopefully the title will become uh, self-evident uh, why, why it's called that. So, but first of all, I just want to uh, say thank you again uh, to Nimbios for um, sponsoring me on this, this short-term visit. And uh, my co-workers on the stuff I'm going to be talking about today, Sergey uh, and uh, Peter Turchin, who some of you may know, uh, I know who's visited Nimbaas before, uh, and Edward Turner, uh, who did a lot of uh, the data collection uh, that we'll be uh, presenting uh, later on. Uh, I'm currently on an ERC postdoc at, at UCL, a uh, project entitled The Evolution of uh, social norms and institutions uh, in real-world settings, uh, but it's, uh, they're not funding this project directly. It's, uh, this is a, a bit of a side project, and uh, hopefully we'll become more than that in the future. Uh, as I say, yeah, um, I'm around this week, uh, and if anybody wants to come and talk to me, I've been given an office uh, over there, and I'm also going to be uh, in Sergei's uh, lab in uh, evolutionary biology. And that's my current email address there, so if anybody wants to drop me uh, some questions as well, um, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So, uh, this movie came out about five years ago. Uh, and like all Hollywood movies, it's a, it's a faithful recreation of what life was like 12,000 years ago. Um, of, but, of course, the, the more observant of you will notice that... Uh, there's maybe something that's a little bit historically inaccurate going on down here. As far as we know, there weren't any pyramids 12,000 years ago. Uh, in fact, before the development of agriculture, uh, humans lived in small groups uh, of uh, subsisting as hunter-gatherers, uh, low population densities, uh, very egalitarian. With the advent of agriculture, however, much more complex forms of uh, society have emerged. And today, we uh, all of us live in very complex worlds with uh, high population densities, official leaders, uh, social classes, bureaucratic forms of uh, administration and government, religions, professional militaries, uh, you know, intensive agriculture, money, things like that. This is actually... Um, the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister of England, David Cameron, up there, during his uh, his Oxford days, uh, kind of typical British elite there. So this this change from uh, small scale simple societies to large scale complex societies has been described by Jared Diamond as history's broadest pattern, uh, and Diamond also points out that there's great variation around the world as to the scale and complexity that different societies were able to achieve. Uh, and there are, of course, many questions we can ask about this phenomenon. So why do complex societies develop in some places but not others? Uh, how does social complexity evolve? And uh, many, many more uh, questions. And those kind of things have been um, debated by anthropologists, political scientists, and other social scientists for years. Now, Sergey talked about my uh, previous work in this area has been involved in using um, phylogenetic comparative methods where we uh, employ techniques developed originally in evolutionary biology. Many of you will be familiar with, and people like Brian have been uh, developing lots of cool, cool methods uh, to address these kinds of questions. Um, but we, we take those methods from uh, biology and have applied them to cultural data. Uh, and some of this is kind of what, what Sergey was talking about here. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about this today. Um, I'm going to be talking about some work uh, that involves a kind of uh, more along the lines of the stuff that you guys do here, uh, involving uh, modeling, uh, creating uh, explicit mathematical models uh, to explore the evolution of socio-political complexity. Uh, and the reason for doing this is that uh, in the social sciences, uh, I don't know how many of you come across social sciences or social science researchers in your day-to-day -day, uh, workings, but um, a lot of the work uh, 
that's been done to explain the origins and development of social and political complexity has been formulated as um, verbal models, okay? So not explicitly uh, mathematical uh, with you know, not precise uh, predictions about uh, what, what we would expect. So mathematical models and simulations can play an important role uh, in testing the logic and plausibility of, of different theories that um, social scientists have proposed. Uh, and they allow us to make more precise predictions uh, that allow us to test competing hypotheses against data. And so in the work I'm going to be talking about, the work I've been doing with uh, Sergey and Peter, uh, we're going to focus on models that try and explain where and when the largest and most complex societies arose uh, and trying to match that onto data from uh, a 3,000 year period of human history. So, uh, nice small side project we've had going for the last couple of years. So in particular, um, what we've been doing is trying to develop models of an idea um, that's been developed by Peter Turchin, uh, who argues that uh, this region of, uh, of Eurasia, the, the Eurasian steppe, uh, was a key uh, proponent or a key uh, factor in the development of um, complex societies in the old world. Uh, and the argument goes that uh, warfare on the Eurasian steppe, warfare particularly between nomadic pastoralists and uh, settled agriculturalists, was very intense. That led to uh, a pressure to kind of scale up societies, uh, make societies more cohesive in order to kind of defend against attacks, uh, prevent either um, decimation in terms of uh, death and destruction or, uh, or kind of uh, assimilation and the exacting of tribute. Uh, and there's some empirical evidence uh, linking this, so in particular the, the, the hypothesis focuses on the development of uh, horse-based warfare as uh, being kind of a very intense form of warfare. So there's this graph is here kind of plots out the largest uh, scale societies increasing over time uh, against uh, with some kind of key developments of some horse-based uh, forms of warfare there. So uh, this is an idea that Peter's uh, uh, been a proponent of for a long time. Um, and so the, the idea of this project was to kind of um, uh, make this model more explicit in terms of try and build a simulation and then see if that works out as a, a plausible explanation uh, to explain the historical distributions of, of states and empires. And as I say, so this builds on work that um, Sergey and Peter did originally uh, for four or five years ago now. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this. This was developed to um, look at cycling, so the evolution of hierarchical organization in complex societies. Uh, so an agent-based model. Uh, and basically we've, uh, Sergey originally and then Peter have adapted this model to uh, make it more specific to the evolution of states and, and empires and testing this, um, this warfare hypothesis. I should add a disclaimer on, on Sergey's part of this model. So <laughs> this model has kind of changed a lot and uh, Sergey originally developed uh, the model that we're going to talk about next and then it's uh, then Peter has developed a new model from that. So anyway, we'll talk about that now. So yeah, so the idea is that what we want to look at is um, the evolution of ultra-social norms and institutions. Okay, so it's no good just having a really, really big group if your group isn't very cohesive. Okay, so what you need are norms and institutions that allow large groups of people to live together and cooperate and be more cohesive. Uh, uh, and these are ways of kind of getting people to cooperate in uh, when their genetic relatedness is low. Uh, and these kind of traits are characterized by the tension between uh, the, 
the kind of the cost paid at the lower level units, individuals paying costs uh, against the benefits that they uh, arise, so kind of collective action problems. And so the examples uh, we talked about there are kind of governance by professional bureaucracies, education systems that produce literate elites that um, do useful things sometimes, and uh, things like generalized trust. Okay, so being able to uh, trust people even if they're not from your uh, king group or, or ethnic group. So you want to see kind of under what conditions uh, favor the spread of, of these kinds of uh, these norms and institutions. So developed a model uh, which has this kind of general logic. So as I say, the idea is to understand what conditions favor these norms. Uh, and the framework is uh, one of multi-level selection. So uh, these traits we model as explicitly being costly within groups, uh, but then increase the competitive ability uh, between groups. We model groups uh, competing with each other via warfare, and then the winning groups will subsume uh, the defeated groups. Uh, and we're going to model two broad groups of factors uh, that affect between group selection. Right. So technology, and that's first of all in the forms of agricultural technologies. So here we're saying that uh, agriculture is a necessary precondition for complex societies. So as I said in the beginning, hunter-gatherers uh, uh, don't form uh, very complex societies. Uh, and military technologies, uh, and this affects the, the probability of uh, successful attacks uh, and also kind of the, the re replacement of um, different cultural traits. Uh, also, the other main factors are geography, uh, which uh, also has an effect uh, in terms of where agriculture is present uh, and the ability of uh, polities to attack and defend defend different polities. Okay, so the idea is that the, you get the spread of military technologies. What we're talking about here is horse-based warfare, which began on that kind of border between the steppe and uh, agricultural societies. Uh, that leads to an intensification of warfare. That favors the evolution of larger scale societies and development of, of ultra-social traits, which gives rise to these, these larger societies. So the idea is uh, to try and test the model uh, against some real data. And so what we're trying to do is to incorporate features of the real world uh, that will uh, affect, uh, affect the, the processes that are occurring in the model. So we explicitly model uh, deserts. So that's where place, basic places where agriculture can't occur. Uh, we, but we allow rivers running through deserts to uh, be home to polities. Uh, we model the location of the Eurasian steppe, uh, and that's the home of uh, pastoral nomads. Uh, and that's also, as I said, the source of uh, military innovations such as uh, chariots and cavalry. Mountains, so the idea that uh, rugged landscapes uh, are more easy to defend, less easy to conquer. Uh, and sea coasts where um, so coastal polities can um, launch uh, attacks against other other coastal polities. Okay, so there's just some maps there. So uh, we kind of make a representation of the world, and uh, we kind of used uh, sources to work out uh, where agriculture uh, at until the point of uh, 1,500 BC, where had agriculture got to? Uh, and also we, um, we have that changing uh, slightly through time as well. So we're looking at a 3,000 year period uh, and uh, over that time um, agriculture spread out somewhat. So it's a, a map of ruggedness there, so you can see the mountains, you've got the Himalayas uh, visible there. Uh, I say location of the Eurasian steppe is in, is in white here. So. So what we're doing is trying to simulate social evolution during this 3,000-year period, 1,500 
uh, BCE to 1500 uh, AD or in the Common Era. Uh, and the model interactions take place on a two-dimensional rectangular grid of uh, 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer cells. Uh, and uh, this model takes place uh, only within Eurasia and Africa. So uh, we try to reduce the, the complexity of it somewhat by um, just focusing on the old world, first of all. Uh, so we model, so each agricultural cell is occupied by a community, uh, and then each community has two vectors of cultural traits. The first one are these ultra-sociality traits. Uh, these are things that bind groups together. And then M is the, the military technology traits. Okay, and I'm going to talk about those a bit more in a second. Uh, so the idea is that we can get these, these different communities, these different cells can aggregate into multi-cell polities, uh, becoming larger, covering more space, uh, although a polity can also be a single community. Uh, and at the beginning of our simulation, so the world is kind of flat in terms of social complexity, everyone. Each, each community is independent. Uh, and so through warfare, Polities can, can aggregate, become larger, but they can also disintegrate. Okay, so we can get decreases in scale as well. And uh, the ultra-sociality traits uh, each community has can change by mutation or cultural assimilation. Uh, and the, the miltech traits, the military technology traits, uh, change by diffusion. So they diffuse out from, uh, from the step. Uh, a given uh, uh, probability. Okay, so equations. Uh, so warfare. So we model warfare is occurring between neighboring polities, uh, and that's initiated with a, a probability of p. Uh, and the probability of uh, an attacking polity defeating a defending polity depends on the relative powers of those. Um, and so then the power of the attacker depends on the, the level of ultra-social traits that they've got uh, and the size, the number of, of cells they're occupying, modified by this beta parameter. Uh, and that's just, that's just um, average, uh, average level of these traits. Uh, and then, so the defending polity is similar, although we also have this effect of, of elevation. So if you're higher up, you have a question. Mm -hmm. So, so each so each polity, also oh, each community, is uh, like is this cell, this grid cell, okay, and they have. So that's the. So basically, they have these, these two these two cultural vectors. Yeah, so, there, yeah, so there's ten, 10 traits, basically, ten, 10 slots that can be either 0 or 1. Binary, Binary yeah. yeah. So at the beginning, they all, they're all 0. And then... So I'm, I'm going to be coming to that hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in the next few slides I'll be describing describing that. If you still have any questions after that, then let me know. Yeah. So they attack each other. Um, their power depends on on this this vector the, of these traits. And then. So those traits, um, kind of, the the traits that these polities have, are uh, um, governed by two processes: mutation and um, ethnocide, which I'll talk about now. So the mutation process. Yeah, so on these 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 binary uh, these binary traits, you have a, a kind of a probability of change from zero to one, uh, and from one to zero. So the loss of these traits. Okay. And so the idea is that 
the loss of these traits is much more likely than, than being gained. So this is trying to model the idea that these traits are, are costly and uh, 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 are not favored by within, within group processes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then ethnocide is the other process, and that's when a defeated cell gets uh, annexed, so it gets taken over by a winning polity, uh, and then it, uh, its cultural traits get copied, uh, or its cultural traits get replaced by the, the traits of the winning polity. Okay. And so the probability that occurs depends, um, is affected by the, the level of um, the military technology. So the idea is that if you have uh, these kind of, these horse-based forms of warfare, then your kind of, your victory is more complete. You get to overrun your, um, your, your victim uh, and uh, they become assimilated to your culture. Uh, and that's also affected by, again, elevation as well. Uh, okay, so, and then there's just a, a background probability of that too. Okay, and then so polity disintegration. So the idea is that these these kind of these groups of cells can also break up, um, and this is modelled here. Is when when they do break up, they break up completely. Uh, so if there's a, a group of ten cells as a polity, then they break up into ten uh, constituent cells. So uh, we can talk about later whether that's the best way to do that. Um, but that's that's the way it works at the moment. Uh, and again, so this probability of disintegration is affected by uh, your level of these, these ultra-social cultural traits. And uh, your size as well. So the larger you are, the more likely you are to split up. But the more ultra-social traits you have, the, uh, the more likely you'll stay, you'll stay together. Okay, so the model has these 12 parameters. Uh, so the effect of ultrasociality on power, these ones affecting ethnocide, disintegration, mutation, and then the effects of elevation uh, and the probability of, of diffusion. So yeah, so and again, 12, uh, sorry, 12 parameters, 10 uh, ultrasociality loci, and five military technology loci. Those, are, those numbers are, are basically arbitrary. Okay, so what we did, this is the, uh, the part that I've been most closely involved with, is the uh, collecting of, of, of data on the kind of the historical distributions of large-scale societies. So basically, uh, along with uh, Edward, uh, we collated, we got um, historical atlases, 100-year uh, time slices, uh, and put those into a geographical information system. Uh, and to show where large complex societies such as here, so this is 300 AD, you've got the Roman Empire, you've got things like the, the Western Jin Dynasty. And so if you lay all those maps one on top of the other over this 3,000 year period, so we're looking here at these polities that are larger than 100,000 square kilometers, so where did polities that were larger than that size occur? And so these red areas are the kind of the hot spots. So that's showing, so, so in places like Egypt and places in China, basically almost throughout this 3,000 year period, there were these large scale societies there. There were no such societies down here in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so this is real data at the moment. So this is this is real data, okay. And so yeah, the the goal is to run the simulation, find out what are the parameters. Uh, can we get something 
out at the end that looks like that. And so there's some uh, some interesting patterns. So so this is uh, average imperial density, uh, and then this is distance from the step. So you see, the further away from the Eurasian step, then uh, the, uh, the less uh, the less frequent were empires. Uh, and then this is uh, I'll show this here for reference. This is just um, uh, kind of uh, empirical estimation of where military technology was. Uh, so this was in this kind of first. 1,000 years, so up until 500 uh, BC, uh, chariots here. The orange area indicates between up until 500 AD, uh, cavalry began to spread out to here, and then at the end of our simulation, or our end of our, uh, the period we're looking at, 1500 AD, uh, horse-based warfare had kind of got up to the yellow areas. Yes, yeah, so this is what, 1500 BC to 1500 AD. So this is, so this part. Okay, so the first map is, okay, so if you think of it as, so dark red here will be, uh, you've got 30, 31 time steps, 100 year time slices. Yeah, yeah. So the, the deepest red means uh, an empire was was there throughout the whole the whole period, okay, for the whole three thousand years. Yeah, white means was not there at all. Orange, you know, orange to yellow to green, decreasing frequency of occurrence of of empires. Yeah, so we're not trying to predict the Roman Empire. We're trying to predict, you know, where empires generally were likely to form. And then this here again, so just to kind of go back to this, this is chariots and cavalry. So the first 1,000 years, then the orange goes out to the second 1,000 years, and then the yellow, the distribution uh, in the last, the last 1,000 years. Um, and again, so if we... First of all, just do some um, statistical analysis of that. So, some predictors. So, our, our dependent variable is uh, imperial density. So, that, that map we had there. And then uh, a number of uh, predictors. So, we've got um, long term presence of agriculture, binary variable, distance from the step, uh, elevation, uh, and then the presence of. Uh, Horse-based warfare. So basically, that map I just showed you there. So what we find is that um, we find that the best, the best model incorporates all of those those factors. Uh, but the main, the best predictors of um, imperial density are distance from the step um, here, and then um, presence of these horse-based forms of warfare. Um, agriculture has some impact, so we can show that by if we uh, include or don't include those different variables, then that affects the uh, the, the R squared here. So, uh, if you here, for example, if you only have agriculture and elevation, your R squared is only about seven percent. You stick everything in, you can get it up to fifty percent or so, and that's controlling for um, non-independence of these um, uh, kind of spatial autocorrelation that are in these in these data. Okay, so back to the the simulation, the model. So uh, we ran, or well Peter ran uh, the, the simulation uh, over this three thousand year period, uh, and played around with parameters. Uh, we weren't kind of interested in the specific parameter values. They're kind of uh, nuisance things. Uh, they don't kind of really match to reality too much. But what we're interested in is can we run the simulation on this uh, spatially explicit grid uh, and get out data 
that looks like the real data. So if you look at the, the period 1500 BC to 500 BC, real data, you can see simulated data, the first large societies kind of occur in similar places. Again, middle period, again, not doing too badly. Getting in China and Egypt and uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and then in this last thousand year period, uh, it's less tight, but part of that is that in the simulation we're not, um, we're not simulating this, this region uh, here. So what we can say from that is actually so there's kind of, you know, we can get data out of the simulation that looks like the real thing. Um, and if I, so there's a little video that you made of this. So I thought, so what I'm trying to do is predict 3,000 years of human history. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try and make a video of the simulation and, um, uh, and the data and try and find the most overblown piece of bombastic music I can get and then show you a music, uh, show you a video of, uh, of the simulation and the real data, okay? So... There's the Roman Empire there. And then Rome starts to break up. Okay, there you go. Okay, so again, so hopefully that shows you that we can. Uh, the model is able to produce uh, patterns that are similar to what we see here, we observe in the historical distributions, okay? So, again, just kind of, so this is looking at the, the spread of ultra-social traits in the simulation, okay? This is not real data. Uh, so again, we start off uh, basically a flat landscape in terms of ultra-social traits. And then as through time, so these things spread in the regions, same areas that you get those large states, okay? So again, China, uh, further out into Europe, okay? So that's just kind of a check that uh, what we think is going on is going on. Now, of course, with any of these, you know, any model you can, you know, if you've got, as reviewers have said to us, if you've got a model with 12 parameters, you can get it to fit anything. That's not exciting. So, although, I mean, we had this information in, in, in there, but um, basically what we've done is kind of turn off the effects of different parameters. Because it could be just there's something about the shape of the grid we're running this thing on that means we get, like, good fits. And that, that's boring, right? So what we've done is to, uh, so, okay, so let's first of all look at elevation. What happens if you turn off the effect of elevation on defensive power? Well, I'm not much. You still get the same uh, overall um, R squared. Uh, what about if you turn off the effect for ethnocide? Then you start to um, reduce the, the uh, predictability. If you don't have any elevation effects in there at all, then you, you start dropping it down further. Uh, and then if we look at uh, military technology, so this is kind of the key point of the model. Um, so if you turn off the effect of this military technology giving you kind of complete victory um, over running the society, incorporating it completely into your society, then that's when you start to kind of really drop off in terms of uh, the explanatory nature of the model. Okay, so that's good, all right? And also, if we allow military technology to affect ethnocide, but we, uh, we just seed it at random, you just have the same number of traits, but you put them anywhere in the, in the world, uh, then again, you don't get uh, these patterns forming. 
Okay, you don't get the the same uh, data at the end of it. Uh, and then if you don't have any any of those effects, then again you you you're losing predictability. Okay, so that means we can kind of be a bit more confident that this is at least a kind of a plausible model um, to explain this. Now, of course, it's not it's not perfect. Uh, these things never are. Um, so there are lots of limitations of this approach. Uh, partly so the, the sampling scheme, so we're sampling the data, the real data at 100 year time slices. That means we miss some uh, important polities, things like Alexander's empire, stuff like that. I mean, that's not necessarily um, uh, something that's not important or yeah. that's not, not something that's necessarily a major problem for us. So you said we're not trying to predict particular empires or particular events. If we're trying to look at the, the, the kind of the average of things, what's going on, the more general process. Uh, we have a quite a coarse grain underlying ecology um, for this. So we've got agriculture is just a, an on-off variable. It's just there or it isn't there. It changes a bit over 3,000 years, but not much. Um, the way we handle deserts, although although we know that societies like the Persians um, controlled vast areas of desert, we kind of just take that out. We don't we just don't model that, uh, and we don't explicitly model the steppe region. We don't explicitly model these pastoral nomads, which um, is something for for future work maybe. Uh, some of the modeling assumptions can be questioned, and we can we can talk about that uh, next. Um, and yet, so our focus is on the old world over this 3,000 year period until 500 years ago. Uh, 500 years ago, of course, Chris Columbus turns up here and everything changes. Uh, but what about the Americas before that as well? And uh, what would we have to change uh, to try and see whether this, this process is going on uh, for more modern things? So we'd have to look at different aspects of warfare, um, things like that. Okay, to kind of conclusions about that part. So the model shows how warfare may possibly select for the evolution of uh, ultra social norms and institutions. I'm not saying it's the answer. Uh, the matching the simulated data uh, to uh, real data shows at least the model is plausible, right? Uh, the logic of the model works somewhat. Uh, and if we turn off the effects of elevation and ethnocide uh, and the location of, of military technology, then we, um, we begin to uh, lose predictability in the model. Uh, and kind of a broader, uh, maybe an implication of this, this line of research, uh, something that uh, Peter and I are pursuing at the moment, trying to get um, funding for is to to look at how kind of long-term processes such as this can affect uh, the modern world in terms of uh, economic and political development. Um, so uh, there are, you know, recent work has shown correlations between long-term presence of, of statehood and kind of how well societies do today. And I think, I think it's an interesting um, pattern in that data so we can, you know, the, over the last 500 years the West has been dominant but when you look at the of the distribution of, of societies in the old and in during that period then uh, other places were kind of the, the major areas of, of civilization then okay so future directions this is um, what I'm here for this week basically so um, trying to develop this model further um, improve it um, and I think importantly try and uh, develop some models of competing hypotheses. Okay, so uh, my favorite approach in science is to not just model your favorite your favorite idea and then uh, uh, find evidence supporting that, but to try and compare different hypotheses and then see which ones do best at uh, explaining your data. Uh, and uh, so Sergey and I were talking yesterday and today about developing a set of candidate alternative hypotheses. Uh, 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 an interesting one is uh, 
trying to develop something along the lines of Jared Diamond's idea about the latitudinal extent of, um, of, of Afro-Eurasia, or Eurasia in particular. Uh, so in this case, we'd have uh, our, our cultural traits being uh, specific to particular ecologies, and if those are kind of latitudinally extended, then that might uh, explain these patterns. Uh, looking at things like, what if we just start with, uh, what if it's all just contingent and something else leads to the kind of the initial formation of, of, diff of social complexity, and then what we're seeing is then is just the contingent effects of that. Uh, we're thinking about, can we get at issues of, of cultural heterogeneity? Is it easier to uh, incorporate another group if they're culturally similar to you already? Um, so that's some of the argument about kind of the conflict between pastoral nomads and agriculturalists is they're very different culturally. Uh, and then something that's not based on warfare at all, but more to do with um, trade and communication um, and how that's affected by, by geography. Okay. So I have, uh, that's the end of my talk there. Um, I'd love to hear any feedback and ideas you have about that. So thank you very much for listening. Maurizio has his hand up. <laughs> So there's, there's, there are no individuals in this. So, so, how so that's model. That's so we, because we don't, yeah, we don't explicitly model the individuals. So we're kind of abstracting that away, and that's kind of in this part here. So the idea is that um, the ultra-social traits are really uh, they're difficult to develop. They're difficult to evolve they're really easy to, to loot. Right? So that could, I mean, that, that can be because they're kind of costly at the individual level. They're kind of, they're, favor they're not favored unless there's competition between, between groups. Right? There's not, it's the, it's the competition between them favoring the, the kind of the larger scale um, that favors that. But also, I mean, more generally, that can be anything, you know, that could be other, other constraints that make those kind of traits difficult to evolve, right? So cognitive constraints, for example, you know, that we've developed in small scale um, primate societies and now we've, you know, so we might not have a, the cognitive ability to, to deal with larger groups. So we need to develop these, these cultural traits as workarounds for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's a good point. We were talking about this this earlier. Um, yeah. I think. Well, maybe there's you know there's just kind of many more things that can go into making these things uh, disintegrate. Um, I don't know whether playing around with, with uh, how these, these things are disintegrating at the moment. So as, as I said, um, the way we're modeling, or the way kind of Peter's put um, disintegration in there at the moment is that these things kind of disintegrate into their single cell communities when they collapse, which, in, which I think means that they then rapidly get conquered again because they, they you know, their, their size goes down to one. So um, those kind of, those time slices are the 100-year are the time slices. So perhaps if we played around with how this is modeled, and I think it's something we need to do anyway, um, we have maybe a more realistic disintegration process whereby you know you you split into two or you split into constituent communities that may mean that we get a kind of more realistic 
uh, process of disintegration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fights over succession and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. What's the, what's the question? Yeah. So the joining part is when so they they fight. One cell wins and incorporates oh, the other I'm one. I'm talking about different cells uniting to more different cells joining together to fight one enemy. All right, yeah. Okay, so you mean kind of alliances and right. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean that's something yeah we don't we don't model explicitly, but um, yeah, I mean I guess that could be another another route to um, kind of coagulation, but I'd have to think about. How much it would affect the dynamics? Possibly not. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So we kind of. We deal with we're dealing with it very abstractly, okay. So um, there's no kind of we don't have any structure to the cells or anything like that. So in a, in a previous model that I, I mentioned earlier that Sergey and Peter had, they were looking particularly at kind of the hierarchical structure of cells, but we don't have that here. We just have kind of conglomerations of cells, yeah. okay, and then their their a polity, okay. And then their their power depends on the average of of the cultural traits within each cell. So there's no there's no kind of emergent. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I mean that's. Yeah, no, we don't, I mean, we don't, we're not modeling any kind of so particular structure there that has um, an emergent effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the, the effect it, it has is that you have the coagulation of, of the cells, but then there, the effect on warfare is based on the, the total group of cells. Exactly. Yes. So, I mean, that's 
I guess what we have to think about there is um, what are the, the different effects on, on polities and, um, you know, is there, is there kind of a, a substantial real difference between those processes that we can kind of model? But the idea is to kind of, you know, have something that's, you know, basically a, a generalizable process or something within the same framework so we can, you know, you know tweak different parameters and on the same, within the same framework and then come out with something, so. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be what are the uh, the assumptions about the background ecology, right? That that lead to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I guess it's kind of the, the locus of where those things are originating will be the kind of the, the key, the key variable there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, So I mean, that's yeah, that's uh, I was getting out of the point about kind of the, the background ecology is quite coarse grained at the moment. So, you know, but it's, I mean, that's kind of an, an area that uh, we're exploring at the moment, trying to get kind of better quality data about productivity and carrying capacities and, and population densities and sizes throughout, throughout history. But it's, it, it's a complicated issue because so many thing, things feed into it in terms of um, kind of crop type and uh, agricultural technologies and climate in addition to in addition to climate and, the, and those kind of things so uh, yeah that's kind of a, a long term a long term goal to kind of feed into this stuff <laughs> it's war and space Yeah, so I mean, chariots were there um, from from the beginning, um, uh, and at least the the kind of the maps we have of the, the steppe region kind of that extends down into the Middle East, so down near Egypt as well. But certainly, yeah, no, historically they they definitely had chariots there.
I think, yeah. 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 Well, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know how complex we'd have to get into into that, but I think maybe one one way of doing that is to build back in the hierarchical structure from uh, kind of uh, Sergey's original model, which which got lost along the way. So, so in that you would have you'd have kind of hierarchical hierarchical groups so then you'd kind of be breaking up into those into those hierarchy in, in, in those kind of sub subsections um, yeah and I think it's definitely something that needs to Oh, well, it wasn't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's certainly, I mean, it, uh, it's, it, it's a testable idea, right? Yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, and again, uh, there's another kind of, project on the boards about um, these kind of axial age religions when you start kind of getting these um, uh, more kind of other regarding tendencies in things like Christianity and, and Islam and stuff like that kind of Pet Peter calls it the Z curve of human egalitarianism right so you you start off with like primates where you got really steep um, hierarchies and then you go to kind of human hunter-gatherers uh, which are very egalitarian, then back up to kind of chieftains and early states, and then kind of back down again to kind of more modern democratic forms of organisation, which kind of seems to begin uh, kind of near the near the time that we're looking at here. So, yeah, I mean it's certainly um, something. Uh, then so that that's you know that's about kind of again these the spread of these particular ultra-social traits. Um, but you're thinking of something more kind of along the lines of xenophobia, right? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> In oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 the other side of the coin, right? <laughs> <laughs> trying to predict the future from the yeah no we haven't yeah not well not as far as I'm aware yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay that's some good <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting you say that because I was I was given an uh, an interview a couple of years ago, and it was about kind of you know it was the uh, to do with the nature paper, and it was that's all about kind of reaching into the past, trying to reconstruct the past and changes over time. First question I get asked is like, what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> it's like. Uh, but yeah, um, but you know, the idea is to kind of go go forward 
with this. So we might, you know, have to change some certain things. So, yeah. I mean, there, there was a, you know, there's, there's a lot of literature about kind of what's going to happen to, you know, predicting the age of a, at what point there's going to be a world, a world state, right? Um, so there's, there's literature about that, and it'd be interesting to see if we can <laughs> get close to other people's predictions. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's later, right? So that's in the 1800s. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, the kind of the establishment of the, the Zulu kingdom um, by, by Shaka is, um, yeah, no, one of those kind of interesting historical cases where we, we kind of, we have historical records of the formation of a primary state, right? Sorry? Okay, I... That's beyond my <laughs> beyond my knowledge, but yeah, I know about I know about Shaka because that's one of those interesting cases where you see kind of chiefdoms coalescing into um, into a, a kind of a, a state. And uh, as far as I remember, there's issues about kind of the role of of, of firearms in that, and in places like Madagascar and Hawaii as well. There's kind of you know debate about kind of how much external influence there was on these things, as there always. As there always is. So, but um, yeah, but that is in answer to your question. Yeah, it's kind of it's outside the uh, the, the parameters of this particular. No, we're not. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I mean, that's. I mean, that's kind of the the task of the future is to kind of go what what then happened next with kind of changes in in military technology, uh, and then yeah, you'd have to kind of then uh, change it into <laughs> nuclear bombs and weapons of mass destruction, all those kind of things. Have I just come back to that? Mm-hmm. <laughs>